Welcome to the series of discussion lectures on the unfolding story of how Henry George's emergence as a populist voice for systemic economic and social reform in the last three decades of the 19th century coincided and competed with the equally populist socialist movement attached to the critical analysis of capitalism, capitalism in quotes, offered by Karl Marx. I'm Ed Dodson. Welcome. The rivalry I refer to was fueled not by Henry George or by Karl Marx themselves. They never met or had any personal interaction. Marx died in 1883, and an English language edition of Das Kapital did not appear until 1887. Henry George did not speak or read in any language other than English. Henry George's first extensive writings on political economy occurred in the early 1870s, the main one titled Our Land and Land Policy. However, soon after the 1879 publication of his widely read book Progress and Poverty, this and other writings by George were translated from English into other languages and attracted international attention. Learning in 1883 that Marx had recently died, George was invited to address a memorial meeting for Marx at New York's Cooper Union. George declined, but sent a message admitting his unfamiliarity with Marx's writings. I never had the good fortune to meet Karl Marx, nor have I been able to read his works, which are untranslated into English. I am consequently incompetent to speak with precision of his views. As I understand them, there are several important points on which I differ from them, but no difference of opinion can lessen the esteem which I feel for the man who so steadfastly, so patiently, and so self-sacrificingly labored for the freedom of the oppressed and the elevation of the downtrodden. British historian Roy Douglas, in his 1976 book Land, People, and Politics, the Land Question in the United Kingdom, 1878 to 1952, compared the level of public awareness in Britain of the two great political economists. He wrote, when Karl Marx died in 1883, there must have been dozens of Englishmen who had argued about Henry George for every one who had heard of the Prussian Socialist. Sometime in 1880 or early 1881, Marx received copies of Henry George's book Progress and Poverty from three different sources, asking Marx for his assessment of George's analysis. From London on 20 June 1881, Marx wrote as follows to Friedrich Sorge, a leading German communist who had made his way to the United States in 1852. Marx wrote, Theoretically, the man, Henry George, is utterly backward. He understands nothing about the nature of surplus value and so wanders about in speculations which follow the English model, but have now been superseded even among the English, about the different portions of surplus value to which independent existence is attributed, about the relations of profit, rent, interest, etc. His fundamental dogma is that everything would be all right if ground rent were paid to the state. I said of it in 1847 in my work against Proudhon, we can understand that economists like Mill the Elder, not his son John Stuart, and others have demanded that rent should be paid to the state in order that it may serve as a substitute for taxes. Marx is referring here to John Stuart Mill, author of the still widely acclaimed essay on liberty, and to the French mutualist philosopher Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, author of the book What is Property? Marx continues in his assessment of Henry George's analysis. This is a frank expression of the hatred which the industrial capitalist dedicates to the landed proprietor who seems to him a useless and superfluous element in the general total of bourgeois production. The statement by Marx is strange in the sense that he was born in and lived in societies very much dominated by landed privilege, by what political economists before him, such as Adam Smith, 
described as rentier interests, able to take and rent what others produce without themselves producing anything in exchange. Landlordism was, at the time, far more extensive everywhere than was the capitalism Marx condemned. This injustice and monopolies in whatever form was exactly what Henry George found so egregious in existing socio-political arrangements and institutions. In fairness to Marx, his insights into how the world worked was evolving. This is evident by what is contained in the third volume of Das Kapital, edited from his notes by Friedrich Engels and published in 1894. In the preface, Engels explained that in his analysis of the role of ground rent in a society, Marx looked primarily to the Russian experience. He wrote, in the 70s, Marx engaged in entirely new special studies for this part on ground rent, owing to the variety of forms both of land ownership and of exploitation of agricultural producers in Russia, this country was to play the same role in the part dealing with ground rent that England played in Book One in connection with industrial wage labor. For reasons Marx did not fully explain, his analysis of ground rent, as captured by Engels, is derived from his conclusion that the monopoly of landed property is the basis of the capitalist mode of production, just as in all previous modes of production, which are based on the exploitation of the masses in one form or another. Thus, Marx recognized that how land is controlled plays an important role in how labor and capital gain access to nature for purposes of production. Suffice it to say that George and Marx both recognized that the wages of those who produced goods or provided services tended to fall as ground rents increased and remained in private hands. To Marx, the systemic implications all came back to his concept of surplus value. He says, all ground rent is surplus value, the product of surplus labor. The direct producers must work beyond the time necessary for reproducing their own labor power, for their own reproduction. They must produce surplus labor in general. This is the subjective condition. What would become a constant issue for debate between the followers of George and Marx was whether the owner of a business actually performed labor, was entitled to wages equal to the value of what that labor produced, and was also entitled to what amounted to additional wages equal to the value of what the capital goods employed produced. What is also true is that capital goods, that is equipment, machinery, technologies, are depreciating assets that must be maintained and eventually replaced. The monetary value of whatever wealth is produced by the use of such capital goods is the source of what is needed for ongoing maintenance and replacement. As the focus of these lectures is not to weigh in on the debate over whether George or Marx most accurately explain how the world actually works, I will simply point to the fact that over the decades after the third volume of Das Kapital appeared, quite a few writers aligned with Henry George quoted from this third volume in support of the view that Marx had come closer to George's conclusions. As an example, the philosopher George Raymond Geiger, son of Oscar Geiger, founder of the Henry George School of Social Science, in his book, The Theory of the Land Question, wrote, Karl Marx himself was most definitive and unambiguous in his discussion of the vital functional position occupied by land. Geiger provides readers with a few pages of what Marx wrote on the land question and on the nature of ground rent, but he has no illusions that Marx had in any way agreed with George as George argued that the fundamental problem was not that capitalists captured returns, but that some returns to own capital were unearned, while all ground rents privately appropriated were unearned. Geiger continues, there is no intention here of placing too much emphasis upon fragmentary quotations. 
it is clearly realized that they are occasional rather than key remarks, and also that they may be interpreted, as undoubtedly Marxians would insist, simply as recognitions of a particular form that capitalism has taken. Socialists in general would argue that land, while indeed a necessary element in production and one which demands socialization, is nonetheless a subdivision of the general capitalistic system and cannot be isolated from its relations to capital. In the volume Theory and Measurement of Rent, a 1961 publication funded by the Lincoln Foundation, established in 1947 by John C. Lincoln, a successful industrialist and committed supporter of Henry George's analysis, the authors survey the history of rent theory. On Marx's contribution, they offer the following context. Marx generalizes and broadens the Ricardian conception of differential rent, stripping away much of the original dogma. In this vein, his exposition begins not with a parable on the settlement of new country, but with a factory, not with the emergence of land rent, but of quasi-rent. What is meant by quasi-rent is essentially an above normal rate of return for the same type of activity, particularly where the supply of labor or capital is fixed, even temporarily. Some economists have applied the theory of quasi-rents as an argument for taxing away any above normal income generated under such conditions. Needless to say, by beginning his analysis with the organization of the factory system, Marx had taken a very different route than that pursued by Henry George, whose study of political economy was aroused by the settlement and populating of the frontier that was California in the 1850s. One can reasonably raise the question of how closely either the supporters or opponents of either Henry George or Karl Marx read and understood the systemic analysis they provided. After their deaths, an almost endless stream of interpretive books were published that in significant ways misrepresented the truths both George and Marx believed they had presented. Debates over what George and Marx actually meant continue to this day. What is not widely known or discussed is the extent to which the philosophies of George and Marx competed in the social, political, and intellectual arenas. This is where our story takes shape. Henry George's analysis was taken seriously, read by some other political economists, and subjected to criticism. Typical was a 27-page pamphlet by Richard Simon, issued in 1880 by a London publisher. Simon begins with his assessment of George's contribution to the science of political economy, then spends the remainder of the pamphlet providing his evidence. A book on political economy, of which 30,000 copies can be sold in a few months, must have some special qualities to recommend it. And although in this case we cannot praise the force and correctness of the reasoning, we must admire the literary excellence of the book and can see in Mr. George's sweeping theories, dogmatically asserted and supported with vehement eloquence, the forces which have made disciples of so many, whose earnest, anxious minds are ripe for a word of power promising a cure specific for the evils that disturb and distress them. Although Mr. George will never found a school of political economists, he has already become the prophet of a new faith and has made converts who are willing to become martyrs. Henry George lectured extensively after coming east to New York City in 1880. Among labor leaders and those who embraced democratic socialism, there were many who thought of Henry George as an ally to their cause. One of the few self-described socialists in the United States who abandoned socialism and thereafter worked for Henry George's proposed public collection of location rents was Charles Joseph Labadee, a trade unionist leader in Detroit, Michigan. In 1881, he opened a correspondence with Henry George and thereafter did all he could to champion Henry George's reforms. In 
Peter Jones, a professor of history at the University of Illinois, wrote in a 1988 article titled Henry George and British Socialism that George's perspectives appealed to both Fabians, such as George Bernard Shaw, Sidney, and Beatrice Webb, and the radical liberals led by Joseph Chamberlain. Others found George either too radical or too timid in the reforms he called for. In 1880, Sidney Webb, who would in 1895 go on to be a co-founder of the London School of Economics, wrote to George regarding the reception he could expect on the tour of Britain George was about to undertake. He said, I am afraid that you will be denounced and attacked by the wilder kind of socialist. Neither the socialist nor any other party is the same here as in America. And the real force of the socialist movement works in lines which you do not at all disapprove. George Bernard Shaw recalled in 1904 how he was drawn to his own activism. When I was swept into the great socialist revival of 1883, I found that five-sixths of those who were swept in with me had been converted by Henry George. It is important to recognize that Henry George emerged as a public figure of a very different sort from most of his contemporaries. The values he embraced, his principles, which I have come to refer to as cooperative individualism, which he repeated again and again before large and growing audiences, allowed Henry George to enter and speak his mind within the corridors of power, even where vigorously opposed. As one example, in 1883, he testified as follows before the United States Senate. Those sympathetic to Marxist perspectives would take note of George's message. George stated, I do not believe that there is any conflict of interest between labor and capital, using those terms in their large sense. I believe the conflict is really between labor and monopoly. Capital is the instrument and tool of labor, and under conditions of freedom, there would be as much competition for the employment of capital as for the employment of labor. As the sales of Henry George's book Progress and Poverty increased across the Atlantic, and in Britain particularly, one of the intellectuals who took the book seriously was Arnold Toynbee a young political economist lecturing at Oxford University's Balliol College. In January of 1883, he delivered two lectures on Henry George's book in St. Andrew's Hall, London. Toynbee was quick to distinguish George from Marx. The book I have undertaken to criticize does not stand alone in economic and social literature. It is one of many similar works which have been inspired by a vision of human misery. It is true that it is not filled, like the work of the great socialist Karl Marx, with detailed descriptions of human degradation. Nevertheless, it has human injustice for its theme. The first pamphlet, which Mr. George wrote, was a pamphlet about the land question in California. And it is no wonder that he should have written the pamphlet, for he saw in a country with natural resources greater than those of France, and with a population at that time numbering not more than 600,000 people, tramps and paupers make their appearance. He also saw the concentration of land in a few hands, one peculiar evil, that is to say, of an old country making its appearance in a new one. However, Toynbee challenged George on George's broader interpretation of history and the facts of their contemporary experience. Nor was he sympathetic to the proposed solutions to societal problems put forward by socialists. What is to be done? I said just now that we economists abandon the belief in economic harmonies. What do we then think of the economic self-interest which most socialists denounce as a thing to be destroyed. We say that economic self-interest most resembles a great physical force than anything else, 
the laws which must be studied in order that it may be controlled. Toynbee, had he lived long enough, might have been quite supportive of the role for government established in the writings of John Maynard Keynes. In 1883, a very inexpensive edition of Progress and Poverty was printed and sold some 40,000 copies in Britain. George arrived in London as 1884 began, completing an extensive lecture tour organized by the Land Reform Union. As reported by Henry George Jr. in his biography of his father, George was quite aware of the socialist influence within the Land Reform Union. Before he opened the course, Mr. George had to settle two important questions. The first affected his attitude towards socialism. Mr. Champion, the treasurer, and Mr. Frost, the secretary of the Land Reform Union, were in reality not wholly in harmony with the individualism of progress and poverty, but believed rather in the collectivism of Karl Marx, who had a few months before died in London after a long residence there. These two men, with one or two others, waited on Mr. George and plainly said that if he did not make the socialist program part of his own and call for nationalization of capital, including all machinery, the socialists would be compelled to oppose his campaign. Mr. George replied with some sharpness that he had come across the sea on invitation of the Land Reform Union to lecture on the principles with which his name was identified and no others, that his principles were clearly explained in his books, and that the socialists could support or oppose as they pleased. And George did just that expressing his views that the real enemy of working people was monopoly in all its forms. The monopoly of nature, of land, being what Winston Churchill would some years later describe as, quote, the mother of all monopolies. George's presence and lectures across Britain and Ireland significantly increased sales of progress and poverty, as well as the sales of his just published book, Social Problems. To many people living in countries where for centuries the land had been under the control of an entrenched aristocracy, the only chance for an improved life was to migrate to a part of the world where the opportunity to acquire land existed. By the time Henry George was writing, the world's frontiers and free or nearly free access to land had disappeared. Moreover, the operation of markets was increasingly dominated by monopolistic enterprises protected under laws enforced by supportive police powers of the state. The followers of George and Marx attempted to build popular movements to rid civilization of the inequities, but by different means and their followers argued different outcomes. In this conflicted ideological environment, workers were everywhere organizing. Eugene Debs, for example, rose within the ranks of the railroad workers and was courted for public office by leaders of the Democratic Party in the United States. With each passing year, Debs became convinced the problems went deeper than trades unionism could solve. An intellectual biography of Debs by Nick Salvatore explains. Reflecting the traditional American emphasis on the promise of nature, Debs presented his case for the eight-hour day. Poverty existed not due to some Malthusian theory or Darwinian selection, but because work itself was not fairly distributed. Further, wages were often below subsistence levels. Similarly, Debs condemned the growing scarcity of free land. Relying on John Stuart Mill, he argued that land derived its productive power from nature and ought not be controlled by a few. In 1885, Debs reviewed Henry George's book Progress and Poverty for his fellow trade unionists, writing, quote, Every laborer in the land should read and study it well. There is much thought in it and much melancholy truth. At a meeting of American labor leaders during July of 1894 in Chicago, Debs added, We must go to the foundation causes if we wish to cure the evil from which we suffer through industrial depression and starvation and wretchedness. 
and I want to advise every member of the railway union and every working man to invest in a book called Progress and Poverty, the greatest book of the century, written by Henry George, the acknowledged prophet of the labor movement the world over. Take it home, read it, study it, and you will there find the solution of the difficulty in the single tax. This will solve the problem, and I wish that wherever men can be found who are thoroughly grounded in this principle and otherwise qualified, the laboring men would nominate and elect them to Congress. Yet by the end of 1896, Debs was convinced of the virtues of what he called enlightened socialism. Although we continued to quote Henry George with some frequency, he no longer believed that even if the full rent of land was publicly collected, this would level the playing field for the world's workers. A search of his published writings finds no comment by him on the death of Henry George the next year. In the 30 July 1887 issue of Henry George's newspaper, The Standard, George recognized Lawrence Grunland as providing the, quote, best exposition on socialism by an American. George added that what German socialism offered was a high-purposed but incoherent mixture of truth and fallacy, the defects of which may be summed up in its want of radicalism, that is to say, of going to the root. Lawrence Grunlin responded with a long pamphlet titled Socialism versus Tax Reform, an answer to Henry George. Grunlin first reprints in full what George wrote in the Standard. Then he calls George to task for what he saw as a superficial criticism of socialist thought. First of all, it is evident from George's objections that he does not understand socialism. But what shall we say of the choice lot of adjectives which he applies to a system or a philosophy which has been elaborated during at least 40 years by some of the most learned and gifted by common consent of Europeans. One of the best studies of the evolution of socialist thought is found in the 1974 book The Millennium Postponed Socialism from Sir Thomas More to Mao Zedong, written by Edward Hyams. Hyams explains to readers that there were two roads leading to the socialist millennium. The Marx-Engels Road by way of the Hegelian state, and the road sketched by such men as Godwin and Tom Paine, and firmly inked in and corrected by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, which entailed the demolition of the state and elimination of formal government. For Marx, the state could and should, by socialization, be made the source of all good, composed as it would be of the whole people, the Hegelian synthesis of man and nation, and ultimately of man and mankind. For Proudhon and the anarchists in general, the state could not but be the embodiment of injustice, so that the very first step to the millennium must be to get rid of that incubus. While living in New York and working to organize the liberation of his homeland of Cuba, the nationalist Jose Marti studied Marx and rejected the path offered to the oppressed by Marx. Writing after attending a memorial meeting in honor of Marx, Marti wrote, Look at this large hall. Karl Marx is dead. He deserves to be honored for declaring himself on the side of the weak. But the virtuous man is not the one who points out the damage and burns with generous anxiety to put it right. He is the one who teaches a gentle amendment of the injury. Morty had met and become friends with Henry George, absorbed what George conveyed to him, and took these ideas to his fellow Cuban nationalists. What George offered was a path of change consistent with Marti's religious convictions. Henry George's progress and poverty has spread among Christians as a Bible. It is the Nazarene's love put in the practical language of our times. And with that, we've reached the end of the first lecture.